You know, if, if I had one wish, I think that would be that everyone could do this in harmony, rightly divide the Word of God. You know, Jesus prayed for <clears throat> unity, that we all uh, be alike and think alike and, and be in one, one heart with the gospel and, and uh, one body. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us that we are to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 and 2 says, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We cannot remain infants or babes in Christ. You know, when we become a Christian, we start our new Christian life and we begin to grow. Just as when a child is born into this world as a little baby, they grow up and they're nurtured and then uh, ultimately became, become a mature adult. And that's the way we are to be from the very point of our Christian life is to grow and mature in the Word of God. We can't remain babes. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and 20 says, Be not Christians, or be not children in understanding. So God wishes that we grow and wants us to grow. Uh, in fact, he, he commands it. Study to show thyself approved. You know, He doesn't want us to remain babies. Uh, even if we've been Christians for many years, we need to uh, heed what 2 Peter 3 and 1 says. It says, steer up your minds by way of remembrance. How do you remember it? Well, you read it and you study it and you go over it and over it and you form that in your memory, in your mind. Steer up your minds by way of remembrance. Uh, you know, to effectively study and understand the Word of, uh, of God, and I'm talking about the entire Word of God, we need an overview of the Bible. We simply just cannot open the Bible and say, okay, I'm going to take this scripture today and I'm going to apply it just the way I think it needs to be applied. We can't do that. We must have a general knowledge of the Bible as we begin to grow and mature in the Word of God and we must apply it in a way that God would have us apply it and that's rightly dividing the Word of God. If we take a scripture and we use it in a way where it does not harmonize with the rest of the scriptures, then we have taken that out of context and we have wrongly divided the Word of God. We must use that in a right way so that it is in harmony and that's the way God wants us to do it. Paul's instructions to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study, to show ourselves, to prove, and it goes on to say rightly dividing the Word of truth. So. God is all-knowing. We talked about this this morning. He knows everything. He sees everything. He knew that there were going to be people that wrongly divide the Word of God, that do not heed to His commands and His desires that we be unity and unified together in dividing the Word of God. You know, the term rightly dividing comes from the Greek word uh, orto, ortodomio, which, which means actually to cut or to divide in a straight line. Uh, some versions say handling a right, uh, that that root word means, but most common translations use rightly divide. Uh, we must understand that the first step in rightly dividing or handling right the Word of God uh, is to come to a general knowledge of what the Bible is all about. You know, there are dividing lines in the Bible. Uh, there are the Bible, the way the Bible is written. Uh, to many people, though, the Bible is just written as a jumbled uh, crossword puzzle. And, and they don't know where to start and where what to study because you study in one book and it talks about one thing and another book and it talks about something else. Uh, they like to just skip around. They'll open the Bible and they like this scripture and they'll use it and they'll skip to another one. and, and they don't know the complete or the full picture of what is going on. Have little idea of the general organization and the purpose of the book in which they're reading. Uh, I want to look at some of the facts of the Bible. Uh, it makes some very astounding claims about itself, about the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That word inspiration or inspired it means that it is breathed of God. Uh, sometimes when we think of the word inspired, uh, many people believe it means to get motivated or get excited. You know, I'm going to inspire myself to do something. But when we talk about the Bible and about the Scripture and, and the way the word inspiration is used, it means that God miraculously gave the words of the Bible to the writers uh, that wrote the books in the Bible. And the inspiration of the Bible is is what is known as plenary inspiration. It means that all of it is inspired, not just part of it, not just a word here, not just a word there, but every single word in God's Word is breathed by Him. It's breathed by His Spirit. Uh, even to the point of the choice of the words that was used in the very beginning when these men wrote, to, wrote their books. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 and 13 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. You see, it didn't come from man. It came from God. It came from the Spirit of God. Many people, even the majority of people who claim uh, to be Christians today do not fully realize the implication uh, when you talk about the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Uh, for example, many say the Bible is historically inaccurate. That it's, it's just not accurate according to some uh, books that are of not a religious nature. Uh, many say this because they don't believe in that plenary uh, inspiration, that not every word in the Bible is inspired of God. Rather, they believe that most of the Bible contains stories that were passed down from generation to generation, and as it was being passed down, these families and these people that were passing these stories down began to embellish these stories and add things to it and, and what it ended up being was just nothing more than a fable or, or a story uh, embellished by man. And as a result, many people do not believe that the great flood that's talked about in the day of Noah, Noah was a worldwide flood. They believe it was merely just a local flood that, that caused great damage during that time, that it didn't cover the earth. Uh, many believe that Jesus was not really born of a virgin, and He was not literally resurrected from the grave. How sad is that? I mean, how sad is it for people not to believe the inspired Word of God? Such a belief makes the Bible entirely unreliable. If you're going to say, this, this part of the Bible is right, but this part's not, you can't trust it, you can't believe it, then we shouldn't trust any of the Bible. It, it's either all inspired of God or it's worthless to us. If the Bible is wrong concerning its, its claim of plenary ins, inspiration, how can we treat anything that it says with the love that God would want us to have for it? We can't. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 18 says, Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith also vain? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. What that means is we wouldn't have any hope at all. We would not have any hope at all. You know, the inspiration of the Bible is, is verified by the, the unity in and with all the different writers uh, that span a, a total of 1,600 years without one single contradiction in the Bible. Not one. There's been many scholars that have looked and read trying and wanting to find some type of, of contradiction. 
But to this date, not one contradiction has been proven that's been found. Uh, the great writers accomplished this great feat even though they came from different backgrounds. They, uh, they spoke different languages, uh, lived at different times in different places, and yet all of the Bible came together as God would have it without any contradiction. Uh, the prophecies of the Bible have been fulfilled, having been made some of them hundreds of years in advance, over 300 of them. The prophecy of, of, of Cyrus and the conquering of Babylon in 539 B.C. was foretold 200 years over in Isaiah before it actually happened. Can you imagine that? Isaiah prophesied that 200 years before it even happened. And it came to be. Uh, there are 330 some odd prophecies such as this that were fulfilled concerning Christ alone. Uh, the mathematical probability of all of these properties, uh, prophecies being fulfilled in one man is estimated to be, and, and I'm not a mathematics, uh, this is what was on uh, one of the programs that I, that I looked at, one over 84 to the 97th power. And, and I'm thinking, I don't even understand one word of that. That's like a different language. So I read this article on it, and I used this in another sermon sometime back, but to give you an idea of what that means and what the probability is of that, think about the state of Texas. Uh, it's a big state. I'll tell you from experience, I've driven across it many times. It takes about 16 hours to get from East Texas to West Texas and about that far going north to south. It is a big state. Think about this. Take enough golf balls to cover the entire state of Texas two foot thick. Mark one golf ball in the midst of all of those golf balls and on the first attempt be able to dive in there and pull out that one golf ball that's marked. The chances are better doing that than uh, the chances of the these prophecies being fulfilled on Christ alone. Can you imagine? What's the odds of, of doing pulling that golf ball out on the first attempt over that many square miles and that thick? Well, it's slim to none at best and slim left town. So what's that leave? None. It's impossible. It's impossible. Uh, there is complete accuracy in, in the Bible. Uh, Isaiah 40 and 22 says it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in and I laugh at this scripture so many times you know there was a time not that long ago when people thought that you could sell off the end of the earth that the end of the earth was flat, that the earth was flat, and if you sail too far, you would just fall off and perish. It's not been that few hundred years that people actually believed that. Uh, but the answer was right here in Isaiah the whole time. It is He that set upon the circle of the earth. The earth is round. Have they not read the Scriptures? The inspired Scriptures of God and, and see where it says that the circle of the earth uh, sitteth upon uh, inhabitants thereof as grasshoppers. You know, the, the earth is round. How could they not know that? Well, uh, people don't study the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They don't take it serious. Uh, the Bible is very historically accurate. E even though people want to say that it's not, scholars for years have claimed that there was discrepancies not in the doctrine of the Bible, but in the accuracy of the historical point of it, in that uh, Luke 2 and chapter 2 speaks of a governor of Syria named Serena, or Serenius. They said that no such governor or no such person was ever governor uh, of Syria. So they said the Bible has to be inaccurate. And so they gloried in their self-marveling about this for quite a few years. Well, as it happened, coins were found 
uh, proving that Serenius was a governor of Syria at two different times. They were found with his name and his picture on it at two different eras uh, in Syria. Can you imagine that? It just disproved these people that wanted to disprove the Bible. The, the Bible is historically accurate. Uh, it has greatly influenced the world. How did we get our Bibles today from, from something that happened so long ago? Well, first off, none of the original uh, written manuscripts uh, that were handwritten uh, by the authors exist today. Uh, our English Bibles of today are based upon copies of the original authors, which were written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and Latin. Uh, so how reliable is the Bible Forget just a second about the accuracy of the prophecies and the doctrine, but how accurate is the Bible and how reliable is it as an ancient book as far as historical value uh, of what's happened and things that it talks about? Well, <clears throat> there's two different measurements that is accepted worldwide in dedicating itself to how accurate a historical book is valued and, and how accurate it is. Uh, the first measurement is the span between the original writing and the first copy. You want it to actually be pretty as close as possible. If the original manuscript was, writing, was written and it was uh, 5,000 years before there was a copy surfaced, then they're going to say, well, you know, that was an awful long time. That should, but uh, what it, the top five accepted writings, ancient writings, that are proven today and accepted by much of the, the, the scientists in the world were copied between 1,000 and 1,400 years after the original was known to be uh, take place, be written. So 1,000 to 14 years is what the world said, or 1,400 years is what the world standard is by these professionals that say, that's what you want. You don't want it more than that. You want it at least a thousand to fourteen hundred years to be declared a truthful ancient writing. Well, the world readily accepts that as being very, very reliable. However, the, the New Testament was first found in the earliest copy to be 245 years after the original was written. Why do the people say that that's not a good ancient copy. 245 years, not a thousand, not 1400 years, but 245 years. It's an excellent proof that it is of God. Uh, nearer to the original than any other ancient writing that they, they've ever found. The second measure is the re, uh, reliability of an ancient book or writings in the number of early copies. So they say if a book was written or recopied a thousand or fourteen hundred years and it had a hundred copies, that's pretty good evidence that it existed. Of the five ancient writings that were studied here, there was around two hundred copies of of those ancient books that were written. And so again, they were readily accepted as proof because there was 200 copies of this earliest book. Um, when you look at the Bible, and I'm not talking about the reprint of what we have today in the English version, I'm talking about the copies of the original manuscript. Do you know how many copies of the original manuscript that they've es estimated that uh, at one time were floating around? 13,000. 13,000. And from that, it's been translated into about every language in the world that you can, uh, can comprehend. Uh, the chapter and verse division were not in the original writings. They were added in order to make it easier to study and read and to, to translate about 12 to 1500 AD. The English version of the King James was translated in the early 1600s. Uh, the word Bible is derived from the word uh, Biblos or Biblos, which means book, and not only book, but it's insinuated that it means a holy book or God's book. 
So when we say Bible and the use the word that it came from, we're saying that is God's holy book when we say Bible. Uh, the overall theme of the Bible, though, from the very beginning to the very end has been the salvation of man. Uh, there, it's made up of 66 books by 40 different writers over a period, as I said early, 1,600 years. Um, from 1,500 B.C. to about 96 A.D. Uh, the Bible has two major divisions, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, the word testament refers to an agreement or a covenant, uh, for a better term, a contract, if you will. Uh, who would it be a contract with between us and, and God? Uh, the Old Testament has 39 books which were written in Hebrew. Uh, it's the history of the origin of man, of the Jewish uh, people. It has uh, four, so to speak, subparts. Uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy discusses the origin and the law. Joshua through Esther discusses the history aspect of, of the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. Job through the Songs of Solomon deals with poetry and wisdom where Isaiah through Daniel are the five major prophets and these prophets were inspired teachers sent by God to Israel. Hosea through Malachi represent uh, minor prophets. You come to the New Testament, it consists of 27 books which was writ written primarily in Greek. It deals with the coming of Christ, His church, and the spread of Christianity. It also has four subparts, if you will. Uh, Matthew through John are, are considered the Gospels. They write about the birth and the life and the death and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts is a historical part of the New Testament. It deals with the history of the early church from its inception on. Uh, Rome. Romans through Jude are, are epistles or letters of writings that give instructions to Christians and uh, revelations uh, written to the seven churches of, of Asia as a revelations of things that would soon come to pass. The entire Bible covers the different dispensation periods from the patriarchal, the mosaic, and the Christian. These dispensations are periods of time in the Bible account for mankind's activities before the flood, after their flood, the flood, their journeys, uh, their bondage, their wanderings, their conquests, their divisions, uh, the life and death and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ, the establishment of the church, and, and the promise to all faithful Christians, which brings us back now, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Of course, this is uh, uh, Paul talking and writing to Timothy. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the good faith or kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. There are so many writings in the Bible that should give us enormous hope uh, this is one of them. Here's Paul, uh, a great servant of God, a great apostle of God, saying, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to be with God. I've fought a good fight. I've finished what God has set up before me to do. Uh, and I know that laid up for me in heaven is that crown of righteousness. Not only for me, but to all of those that love His appearing, that do what He says do, and are, are, are obedient to Him. You know, we need always to be concerned about rightly dividing the Word of God. It is so important that if we misdivide the Word of God, then it's no longer the true Word of God. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. How can we do that if we alter His Word? We must keep it and rightly divide it. We must be determined to, to learn study the Bible, apply it in our lives. It's the precious, inspired Word of God. It proves itself to be over and over and over again. Uh, may we always follow it and use it as our guide in life because that's what God gave it to us for, to be our guide in life that guides us through this life into the next. 
Psalms 119.105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Have you ever walked in the dark without a light? How difficult is that? It's pretty difficult, isn't it? You can stumble around and run into things, but here it's compared the Word of God as a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. How wonderful when we use the Word of God the way it should be. 1 Peter 4 and 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. 1 Peter 1.25 says, The word of God, it endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. I hope you're a Christian today. I hope you have the unending faith in God that's going to get you that crown of righteousness one day when you face God. If you're here tonight though and you're not a Christian, if you've never obeyed the gospel, I would certainly hope that you would want to be obedient to the Word of God. It is the true Word of God. It's proved itself to be over and over again. And it has never been disproved otherwise. You know, no matter what people say, what people ridicule, uh, how they tear the, the Word of God apart and use it in a crazy way, uh, God intended it to be rightly divided. He intended it to be a guide in our life. It's to get us from this life into the next with Him. And if you're not a Christian, you, you can't do that. You don't have that hope of an eternal home in heaven. If you don't have that hope, I urge you to obey the Gospel. Hear the Word of God. Believe it. Be repentful. Confess Christ as the Son of God. And be baptized for the remission of sin. You know, we, we study in Acts and the class with Larry this morning uh, in chapter 8, uh, as with every conversion in Acts, they had to do exactly the same thing. It's no different for us today than it was for those early Christians. They had to do the same thing because our God is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. And He requires this of everyone. If you're not a Christian, we'd certainly hope you'd want to be obedient to the Gospel. If you are a Christian and maybe you've strayed away, don't remain in that condition because it's a dangerous place to be. Don't play with God. Come back home. Renew your service to God. If we can help you tonight, there's a song of invitation that's been selected. Let's stand and sing that song and use it for what it is. It's an invitation to the Lord. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, and Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy 
blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Thank you, Steve. The Lord's Supper has been prepared for those that...